years. He's been very active. He's taught a lot of ladies of the lathe classes. Um, he is well known for his pepper mills. Um, so I'm going to turn the mic over to Pat Scott, who's going to do the demonstration on pepper mill. Am I, am I on? You guys, can you hear me all right? Okay. Joke. 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 You know, my wife says I can't tell any jokes. She says my jokes aren't funny. I, and I, you know, I said, you don't know good comedy. Of course, I used my inner voice when I said that, but uh, I just, but I, I just got a quick one. So why did the dermatologist lose his job? He kept making rash decisions. <laughs> Hey, I got that off the of TV. That wasn't one of mine. So, well, good evening, everybody. I'm I'm uh, glad to be here, and I actually had three people come up and tell me that they're looking forward to my demo. Of course, I can't remember two of their names, but they were real people, and uh, and they really did say that. So, um, before I start, though. Uh, Pat Carroll was supposed to be our demonstrator tonight. I think you all know that. If you came here tonight, if you didn't get the notice, uh, and if you came here tonight to see Pat Carroll, I apologize. Uh, he couldn't make it because of his uh, visa problem and stuff. Um, but if it helps, uh, my name is still Pat, so I don't know if, if that helps. Um, but but for those of you that uh, that uh, came here, you know when when Jay called me and said. Uh, and asked me if I could move my demo up a month. Uh, he says, you know, Pat Carroll can't come. Can you move your demo up? And I thought, well, what's he going to try and do? Just slip in a different Pat and hope nobody notices? And, <laughs> and then I thought, well, the people are going to notice. But it, uh, then I thought, you know, it, maybe if I just wear my face shield all, all night, that, uh, <laughs> that well, then you guys, uh, yeah, this will be all right. Let's see you do and, that. And, uh, <laughs> For those that don't know, that's Pat Carroll. So that's my there. That was my joke. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys a demo tonight on making pepper mills, uh, <clears throat> making pepper mills, and I call this demo the perfect pepper mill. Uh, and and by that, what I mean is when I make pepper mills, I try and make every aspect of them just as perfect as I can. So the holes that I drill in the bottom or through the mill, the holes that I drill, I want them perfectly sized, perfectly centered. Uh, I want the, the top to fit perfectly. I want, I want it to spin freely. I want the gap between top and bottom to be perfect. No binding, no squeaking. I want uh, the curves, the, the sanding, the finish. I want every aspect of that uh, to just be as perfect as I can. Uh, I've been passionate about making pepper mills since 2011 when I took a class at Craft Supply uh, with uh, Paul Chilton. Have any of you guys heard of Paul before? Paul was, uh, I know somebody in the back has, two people. Paul was a professional wood turner. He's retired now, um, but he made beautiful mills. And for those of you that don't know Paul, in the Craft Supply catalog, can, can you zoom in on this? Which camera? <laughs> in the craft supply catalog under the artisan mechanism, those are Paul's mills. Um, and, and I think they're beautiful. I love them. I love the, it's a box elder. I love the shape, the proportions. I just love those. So when I found out that Paul was going to be teaching a class, I, I was excited to take it. And it was a great class. It was just a, a weekend workshop, two-day class. We made two pepper mills uh, that weekend. Um, and it doesn't take a, a day to make a pepper mill. Um, maybe your first one it might, but uh, once you get the hang of it, it, it goes a little bit faster. Uh, but we learned a lot, learned a lot. I had made pepper mills before seeing, uh, or before taking this class, but you know, I was kind of unsure, am I doing the steps in the right sequence and things like that. And, uh, but after I took this class, that, that really kind of helped, you know, helped me in my ways. The way I make pepper mills today is pretty much the same, same way as I was taught back then. Uh, I do a couple of things different. Um, for example, uh, back then, uh, negative leg scrapers were not as uh, popular as they are today. And so now I've changed a couple of those steps that we were taught, and I use negative leg scrapers, for example. Uh, and that's really sped up my production, and the finished product is, I, I think it's uh, just as good, if not better. So I'll show you, I'll show you how I do that. 
Um, let's see. So who, who has made a pepper mill before? No, wow, nice. Who would like to make a pepper mill, but you're, <laughs> but you're kind of intimidated by all the steps, right? Um, well, people are really surprised when I tell them that there are really only four basic steps to making a pepper mill. And it doesn't matter what mechanism you use, there's just four basic steps. Uh, the first step is you take a piece of wood, mount it on the lathe, you turn it round, put a tenon on each end, cut it in half. That's step one. Step two is you drill all of the holes. Step three, you shape the outside profile. And then step four is you sand and finish. And that's it, just those four basic steps. Now that might seem a little bit oversimplified, and it is. You know, uh, in reality, there's probably <coughs> 20 or 30 uh, steps, um, but uh, just think about those four steps and you'll be just fine. I gave the same demo to the Northern Club in May. Uh, they recorded it. It's up on their YouTube channel. So if you go to um, Rocky Mountain Woodturners uh, YouTube channel, you'll be able to watch the demo. Uh, tonight's going to pretty much be a repeat. Are you going to, is this going to be recorded and put up on our Front Range Woodturners YouTube as well? Um, the Rocky Mountain Wood Turners, I think also if you just go to YouTube and do a search for the perfect pepper mill, uh, you should find my demo. So hopefully uh, tonight's demo will be perfect, just like that other one. That's right. So all right, I'm going to get started. I know I talk too much, uh, and I need to make sure I have enough time to uh, finish. So there are a couple of things, in my opinion, that you need before you get started making a pepper mill. Uh, uh, one of those is a mechanism, of course. Um, the mechanism that I'm going to use tonight is the one that I uh, have used in all of my mills. It's the deluxe mechanism that Craft Supply sells. Uh, Packard Woodwork sells the same thing. They also call it the deluxe mechanism. Uh, it's made by Chef Specialties, which is a company out of Pennsylvania. They've been around since 1940 uh, making mills. They sell mills. They sell mechanisms. So they've been around a long time. They make a uh, stainless steel mechanism for pepper, and then they make a separate ceramic mechanism for salt. Uh, and they carry a lifetime warranty. Um, another uh, mechanism that Craft Supply sells is the Artisan brand which is a good brand also. Uh, I've used that before. Uh, and then probably the third uh, popular mechanism is the crush grind mechanism, which is a ceramic mechanism. It's made over, does anybody know Dutch? Or it's made overseas somewhere. Um, has a 25-year warranty. It can, it can grind salt, pepper, and other spices. And did my volume go out? Are you guys still here? And uh, the people that use it, people that use crush grind love it. Uh, I've got a couple of their mechanisms. I just have never, I've never made a mill with their mechanism yet, but, but that's another good one. So any of those, they're all about the same price. I think the, the Artisan and the Deluxe, they're within a buck of each other. The crush grind is a couple bucks more, but uh, they're, and, you know, pick a mechanism, they're all good. So you need a mechanism. Uh, the next thing you need is a dry piece of wood. And look, I even wrote a demo on this one. Um, they, they don't sell it that way. I had to write that on myself. You need a dry piece of wood, and I, and I really cannot emphasize dry enough. Uh, if you've ever used a pepper mill where you turn the top and it gets to a certain spot and it kind of binds up, and then you turn a little bit more and it frees up, there's a couple of things that can cause that, and one of those is that they did not use a dry piece of wood. And after they shaped it, it dried a little bit more, and it doesn't take much. Dried a little bit more, went out of round, and that can cause that top to bind. Um, so you need a dry piece of wood. If you if you just get some wood, you know, a tree that's been cut down, uh, and you and you just you know cut a blank. If you go by the rule of thumb that a lot of people say, they say for every inch of thickness, you need to allow a year to air dry. Well, a typical pepper mill blank is 3 by 3 by 12. So 3 inch thick, that means you got to allow 3 years to air dry. That's a long time, right? It might seem dry on the outside. The end might seem dry. You put a moisture meter on it, and it's going to say it's dry. But remember, a moisture meter really only goes in about 3 quarters of an inch. Where we want it to be dry is in the middle of the blank where the, the mechanism is. So it's going to take a while for air to get into the center of this blank. So we might be able to get by a little bit less time because it's so dry here in Colorado, but you really need to use a dry piece of wood. 
if you can't uh, wait three years, you can certainly laminate boards together. And, and I've got a couple of mills over there where I just glued boards together, and that works just fine. You can buy a blank online. Um, uh, be careful, uh, some of the, and you can buy them upstairs too. Uh, be careful if you buy a blank that's got wax on it, wax coating on it, I can guarantee it's not dry. Um, they wax those things so they don't crack. So be careful with that. Some of those uh, wax coatings are a real thick paraffin wax coating, and they, they really seal the blank, and they seal it so good air can't get in and moisture can't get out. So what I recommend is scrape that off, scrape all that wax coating off, and then just reseal the ends yourself with a greenwood sealer, anchor seal, something like that. Yes? I do not pre-bore them, uh, and I don't do that for a couple reasons. Uh, one, it's real hard to get that hole aligned once it's gone oval, uh, but two, now you're committed to which is the top and the bottom. And <clears throat> when the blank dries, if you get cracking and stuff like that, you might decide, I want this to be the top instead, but you've already bored a hole through the center. Uh, so I, I don't, I want to make the decision on which is top and bottom and how big this is going to be uh, after the, the blank is dried. Good question. Oh, the, the question, we have people on Zoom, right? Question was, do I ever bore the holes uh, through at first? Like rough turn, rough turn a blank. Pepper mill blank. I do not. I do not. I cut my blanks, you know, three by three by whatever length and uh, let them dry. You can see on, on this blank, I've cut the ends off. Uh, so this piece was uh, actually this, this uh, is a piece of sycamore that I brought back from a class a craft supply that I took in 2016. And I've cut the ends off already. Uh, any checking, any cracking, any defects, I want to uh, cut that off and get down to clean wood. And so you can see I've, uh, the end on here and here, uh, both of those ends are nice and clean now. <clears throat> Something else I've done is I've cut the corners, oh, good camera view. I've cut the, the corners off. Uh, and if you do that to let them dry, you're, you're reducing the drying time by about 20 or 25%. So now instead of the air having to go from the corner to the center, now, now it just has to go from here to the center. So that's a, I don't do that on all my blanks because sometimes I'm processing 50 blanks at a time and I'm just tired and too lazy. Um, but if you, if you do that, that'll reduce that drying time. Save those cutoffs and you can use them to stack up uh, blanks as well. What are your favorite woods? Anything that's free. <laughs> Anything that's free. Um, I, yeah, oh, what, what are my favorite woods? Thank you for the reminder. Yeah, I'll try and repeat the questions. My favorite woods are anything that's free. Um, and there's a lot of, I make a lot of salad bowls and stuff like that, and there's some woods that I, I do not like to use for salad bowls because they're not durable enough, but those same woods would make a, make a fine pepper mill. I probably would avoid really soft woods like aspen or uh, pine or something like that because those are real soft and I think over time uh, at that head turning all the time that that's just going to cause some wear. Um, but I have a, uh, I, I brought one anyway, it used to be over there, uh, cottonwood uh, pepper mill. Cottonwood it makes a fine pepper mill, uh, nice and durable. So. Yeah, anything that's free. I will buy pepper mill blanks. I don't like buying bowl blanks because I'm, I'm too cheap, but I, I'll buy a nice, uh, nice uh, madrone burl or, uh, you know, big leaf maple burl or something like that, uh, you know, if I, if I find a real nice piece. But, yeah, good question. Thanks. Yes? Uh, I don't get too many burls, so those are the ones that I have to buy. And uh, there used to be a place in Oregon that I would buy them from, but they went out of business. They're wholesale only, so uh, I can't answer that now. Don't know where to buy any burls from. But if anybody knows, let me know, and I'll. I, otherwise, I guess I just would search online and just, yeah, just search online. But I don't have any sources online that I buy from. So uh, once in a blue moon, I'll run across a box elder burl in town. Uh, and if I do, I'm a happy guy, but that's like few and far between. So, yeah, I can't answer that. Um, let's see. So where was I at? Oh, dry piece of wood. Mechanism, dry piece of wood. Uh, oh, and then you need a design. The third thing, you need a plan. What am I going to make this thing look like when I get all done? Uh, and I, 
I, I could spend a half hour talking about design. Uh, in my book, it's important. Um, if you just go out there and mount this on the lathe and then just start, let me see what the wood wants to be. I'll let it speak to me. And to <laughs> that, I don't buy that at all. Uh, and I say that because you guys have the sharp tool in your hand that cuts wood. So cut the wood, right? Cut it to whatever shape you want. If you just go out there and, and practice beads and coves, it's going to look like when you got done, you practice beads and coves. Uh, and if you haven't looked at it yet, I have a binder up here, a, a notebook of ugly pepper mills that people have just look like they practice beats and coves. Nothing will flow. The proportions will be off. Have a design. Don't just have it in your mind, but draw it out. Draw it out full scale. And this is, uh, I think this is important. Take the 15 minutes or half hour and sketch it out. Uh, and if you, if you don't like something, erase the line, change your proportions. Uh, it, the advantage of this, when you get all done, is now you can take your measurements directly off of this. And you can say, oh, my, my wide part is this big, and it's so far from the bottom. My narrow part is this big. My top is this big, et cetera, et cetera. If you're not much of a drawer, and you find a mill online that you like, which my Tilton, print it out. See if you can print it out full scale. Uh, it doesn't always work. Sometimes the, uh, the proportions are off. but but that's a starting point, and then now you can take your measurements off of it that way. So I strongly recommend that you uh, draw out a design. I've got a couple of reference books over here. Uh, one of them is Turning Salt and Pepper Mills by Chris West. He's got plans in there uh, for the type 2 mechanism, which is what, we, what I use, and then he's got the crush grind. So if you guys uh, or stuck for design or where do I start that's an excellent reference that book and then also uh, making a pepper mill focus on design that's the name of the DVD by Ted Sokolowski and we have that DVD in our club library and I can't tell you how many times I've watched that DVD it's a it's an excellent uh, DVD it goes into a lot of detail and uh, and both of those will help you on your way what is Pinterest, Pinterest has a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of pictures and stuff like that uh, to get design ideas and stuff. You bet. All right. So uh, only four steps to making a mill, right? Step one is mount a piece of wood on the lathe. So I've got a dry piece of sycamore, and I've cut the corners off. I need to mark the center, but I've cut the corners off. So I can't just put a ruler from corner to corner. What do I do? Well, the next thing... You, could, you can grab one of these center finders. You guys all know what these are like, right? And, and you can put that on here and mark corner to corner that way. The problem with these is, I don't know if this shows up in the camera, but this didn't dry square. So it's not 90 degrees. So now, which is my reference edge? Well, maybe you just make both marks and take the average or something like that. That would work. That'll get you close enough. Uh, something else you can do if you have a blank that's not round, uh, maybe you're missing part of a corner or something like that. What I've done is I just have a disc. I just made it three inch disc and I can just easily set that on the end of the blank. I'll feel with my fingers the overhang and you'll be surprised how quick and accurate you can, your fingers are. And I'll just feel my overhang and then I'll punch my center and then just like that. And I guarantee you can't mark the center faster using any other method. So that's, uh, that's just another trick right there that I use.
Thanks. Thanks, Larry. Oh, I... Yeah, we're going to kind of need that. I could. A revolving center. I think Larry's got one. Or a four, do you have a four prong or something like that? I can't believe I left, left that at home. We could do it a different way, but it's... Uh, thanks, Larry. To the rescue. Okay. All right. Um, at home, I use a, uh, a step center. Um, really, what you're supposed to do with these four prongs is you're supposed to drive them in with a mallet and stuff. So let's let's see if I can make it work without. Oops. All right. I think we'll be all right. We'll f find out. And if don't take offense, but I'm gonna. Use a different tool rest. All right, step one, we're going to mount a piece between centers. Um, there's, there's different ways to do things, obviously. You know, I could, I could grab this end in a chuck and turn this round and then grab, you know, reverse it and all that, but I just find using the, putting it between centers to be faster. Oh, let's get my tools out. Here, I thought I was all prepared. I didn't even take my tools out. Okay, now we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to be on the, I turn on the high speed. My tool rest is just a little bit above center. Let's see how we're doing here. All right, and I'm just going to turn it round at this point. It doesn't have to be completely round. The main reason that I'm going to turn it around is just to get a better look of the wood. And also, when I put my hand on it to, f to slow it down, I, it doesn't hurt my hand. And, and that really is the, those, the two reasons. So this is step one. Mount a piece of wood. Turn it around. Put a tenon on each end. And then cut it in half. Okay, and that's good. And and you can see I'm not I'm not completely round, and I don't need to be. Uh, there's some people on YouTube that I've seen, and they're out there with their calipers making this thing perfectly round, and to me that's a waste of time because you still have to shape it. So what does it matter? Like I said, I just want to I don't want to hurt my hand. All right, so now I'm going to put a tenon on each end. There's different tools you can use to do this. I've got a uh, beading and parting tool. There's, oh, am I using this one now? Straight, that's awesome. I don't know if you guys can see that. A beading, 3 8 beading and parting tool. You could use a spindle gouge, a uh, diamond scraper. Um, I do want to make sure that those inside shoulders are square, so I am just going to use a skew to clean up that inside edge. And then I want to check them. If it's not, you'll, you'll feel this uh, bottom out. If it's not square, this will just be mushy, so that's good. Um, I could have used a skew to shape those. But if there's any kind of a knot or a missing piece of the wood or something like that, a, a bark inclusion, uh, I find the skew gets a little bit um, grabby. 
uh, and it also vibrates more than the beating and parting tool. But either one works. All right. Now we have to cut it in half. And this is why I say you really need to have a design, a drawing, uh, before you start, because you need to know where to cut it in half. So the design that I'm going to make tonight, it's, uh, it's, it's, we're going to do, we're going to do this. Um, and we're doing this because it's real quick and easy for me to shape, and I'm usually running out of time, so I need something fast. But the, uh, the design calls for, here's my pencil, uh, a five inch base, which is real easy. I'm going to make an eight inch mill tonight. The piece of wood that I've got is eight and a half inches. If the ends of your piece of wood, if the ends of your blank are clear, there's no knots, no cracks, no checks or anything like that, you really only need to allow a half inch extra length to make a mill. So for a 10 inch mill, I'd, I'd have a 10 and a half inch blank. Um, I cut the ends off at home to save time, but uh, if there is any cracking, I just keep cutting it shorter and shorter until I got back to good wood. And even if I wanted this to be an eight inch blank, if I had cracks, oh, okay, now it's gonna be a six inch blank. Doesn't, you know, don't try and stretch it uh, if you've got uh, bad wood. All right, so my particular, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this the top and this the bottom. So I was just measuring up from the bottom five inches. Are you measuring from the actual end of the wood? Yes, from the very end of the wood. So notice my tenons are, are nice and big. When I do my final shaping, my final shaping includes these tenons. So they'll get removed during my final shaping. Um, there's a lot of guys that will add extra length to the wood. You know, they say you got to have a longer piece of wood uh, to allow for the tenons. And then one of their steps farther in is to go ahead and remove the tenon. To me, that's, that's extra work. And you have to allow extra wood and all that stuff. So if I've got clean ends like this, uh, then, then that's, that's going to be the, my final top and that will be my, my final bottom. On an, on an eight inch mill, I'll just say that uh, a, a typical top is two inches and a base is six inches. You know, that's a good starting point. This particular design that I'm going to make uh, looks a little bit better with a little bit longer top. So again, it all comes back to your design that you're going to, uh, that you've drawn out. So I have a five inch base from, from my pencil line to the end of my mill is three and a half inches. So I'm going to end up with a three inch top and a half inch is going to be for my parting cut and for the spigot that will fit into the uh, base. I'm going to use a, a thin parting tool. This is a 16th inch parting tool. Uh, it's made by Ashley Isles, if you guys are interested. I bought it at Craft Supply, but I don't think they sell it anymore. I bought this 15 years ago. Um, it's it's sixteenth of an inch here, and then it gets thicker. You can't tell, but it's well maybe you can. So it's real thin at the tip, and then it's thicker back here for stability. If you want to buy something like this, look at uh, Carter and Son and D Way Tools. They both sell something uh, just like this. So I'm going to go ahead and part this in half, but I'm not going to part it all the way in half. I'm going to go part way, and then I'm going to cut it in half the rest of the way. Oh, smoking a little bit. Give myself a clearance. There we go. Man. Smoking more than... Sycamore is real similar to maple, but that was cutting pretty hard. You can can you smell it? Burn a little bit. Usually I can usually I can I part up until uh, right there. I'll part in that far and then I stop. But uh, that's okay. All right, then I'm going to cut it in half. The reason you don't want to try and part this completely through on the lathe is uh, it will pinch your parting tool and it'll come flying off at you. Release your tension. Release it too much. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so you can see where that's binding my, my, my saw right now. Can you imagine if my parting tool was in there and this thing was spinning at 1500 RPM? Yeah, it would come off uh, violently. And bad words would be said. And this is a family channel, right? So no bad words. Oh yeah, look at the burning. Look, geez, look at the burning. Turn that upside down for the camera. Okay, we don't need the uh, center anymore. Thank you, Larry. All right, now we're going to put it in a chuck. Now, over the years, um, I have bought certain tools and certain chucks, uh, chuck jaws and stuff to help me with pepper mills, help, help me specifically make pepper mills. And this is one of those, the, the jaws that I've got right here. I'm using a Vicmark chuck. This is the V100, this, or the VM100, the smaller size. And these are the, what, what's called the 74 millimeter uh, shark jaws. And <clears throat> at this, excuse me, at this stage, you don't need the shark jaws, but they have a, a big advantage that I'll show you um, later on. And, that, and um, that will be the reason the main reason why I bought them. But so again, I've already talked about my tenons. My tenons are big, they're maximum diameter. Everybody, well, if you don't know, you get the best grip when your chuck jaws are almost in a perfect circle, when they're just opened up just about an eighth of an inch. So I've got big tenons, so I've got big diameter jaws to grab those. If I was to use the standard two inch jaws that come with the Vicmark, uh, and I, if I wanted that complete or that uh, you know small circle tight circle for my jaws my tenon would be smaller and then I'd have to take that into account in my design or I'd have to allow extra wood so this way I can I can utilize the full blank let's see how uh, do you guys see how how perfect that ran zoom in on that um, so obviously that's where I cut them in half. Yeah, I brought sycamore because it'd be an easy wood to turn, but look at that. I'm going to put a tenon on this end just so I can uh, put it in a chuck and start hollowing, uh, start drilling from the other side. Let me just, just give me a sec here. Here I'll use a, I'll use a skew just to show you you can do. That's all you need. Make sure it's. I, I how long? Uh, the tenon is maybe three sixteenths. I never go no. Uh, I, I never make them longer than a quarter of an inch. Uh, it doesn't. You get the best holding power by diameter, not length. Sorry, I've, at, at home I've got magnets and everything, so I'm I'm looking for my where I put everything at. All right, let's turn this around. Okay. This, this surface isn't running true, but look at that surface. That's what counts, is that surface right there. We can true that up. That's my tenon right there. I'll go ahead and true this surface up. And uh, you don't have to do it now. I could drill the hole first. Um, but what I find is that if it's running out of round like that, it can affect your uh, drill bit as it starts to enter. You can use your uh, spindle gouge, bowl gouge, whatever you feel like. Just to, We'll just true this up a little bit. I'm also going to undercut this slightly. Let's see how I did. Okay, so it's flat, it's straight, that's what I want, and then it's it's undercut just a little bit. And that's a pretty smooth cut too. All right. So now let's drill a hole. Oh, what did I do? Larry, what did I do? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the deluxe kit that I use 
it calls for a one and five eighths inch diameter hole that's drilled a half inch deep. And this is just a clearance hole, so it doesn't matter if you're a little bit off. No, start big and go small. Because if you, if you start small, now your big bit, the point of your big bit, doesn't have any kind of a reference on where to start. But if I drill my big bit, uh, my big hole first, I still have the center point for the small bit to get started in. A um, couple of things. When uh, I only drill about 500 RPM or so, you don't want to go too fast. Um, the, so again, this is a 1 and 5 eighths inch diameter, uh, and I need to go half inch deep. This is a clearance hole just to give room for the mechanism. If I'm off a little bit, a little bit shallower, a little bit deeper, uh, it's not that that bad. It's not that big a deal. Um, a couple of things. Instead of having to measure all the time, my bit happens to be a half inch long. So I can just drill until the back of the bit is even with the wood. That's, that's a quick, easy way. And again, if you're off a little bit, it doesn't matter. Um, this is a, a 3520C model. And on the A and the B model, and then the jet, I believe the jet 1642, also, for every turn of the handle, it's a sixteenth of an inch. So on my B model at home, if I want to drill a half inch, all I have to do is just count eight revolutions, which would be eight sixteenths, which is the same thing as a half an inch. Uh, on this model, I think every revolution is about 330 seconds. So it might be about five turns. We'll find out. Otherwise, I'll just go by the back of the bit. And we're going to go around 500 RPM. That's 513. That's good enough. Notice uh, also whenever I drill any of my holes, a lot of guys will just they'll just shove the bit up into the wood and then they turn the lathe on and, and the wood's doing one of these and their bit's doing one of these also. Uh, I don't do that. I don't do it that way. My bit is stopped short. It's not touching the wood. I turn the lathe on first, let the, let the wood start spinning, and then I'm going to slowly advance the bit while and let the bit register itself. Let the bit find its own hole. I don't make a pilot hole like a lot of people say you should do. Um, I, I want the bit to make its own hole. Let it get registered. Let it get established. And then once the wings start cutting, that's when I start counting my revolutions. So that was one. If this bit wiggles a little bit, I don't like it, but it doesn't matter because it's just a clearance hole. Wow, that was, what was that, like three revolutions, wasn't that? Um, if this bit wiggles a little bit, I don't like it. I don't like it to, uh, but it doesn't matter that much because it's a clearance hole, uh, and I'm going to clean up that hole anyway. All right, now the instructions say to drill a 1 and a 16th inch hole through the base. Well, never try and drill completely through uh, from one side. Always drill from both sides. Uh, if there's any mismatch, it's going to happen in the center where the customer's not going to see it. If you were to try and drill all the way through, guaranteed when that bid exits on this side, it's either not going to be centered or it's also not going to be round. It's going to be oblong because the wood is going to, it's going to knock that bid off course and it's not going to be running true. So always drill from both sides. So again, I'm going to stop short, going about five, 513 RPM. And I don't know if, can, can you zoom in on, on this view coming in this way? Not, not this way, but from the end. Can you zoom in even more? Even more? Is that, as, is that at max? OK. It doesn't really show the bit then like I wanted. That's all right then. All right. So. Watch my bit. So I was going slow. I was letting that bit get established. Let it, let it uh, find its own center. Now it's important to clear chips out as you drill a hole. So a lot of guys will drill in a ways. They'll back the bit out. They'll blow air in there. They'll shove the bit into the hole again. Drill some more. Back it out. Blah, blah, blah. Well, if, if you're going to do that, just save yourself some time and just blow the chips out as you drill. Can with 
somewhere around in there. Oh, good, good. We'll need that view in a minute here. All right, good. That, that's my new Harbor Freight uh, quiet air compressor. It wasn't that loud, was it? It's pretty cool. All right, that hole that I just drilled, I'm supposed to drill a one and a sixteenth. That was a one inch hole. Uh, drilling into end grain is hard. It's hard on the bit. It's, it's hard wood that you're trying to drill into. So I use uh, that bit that I was using. It's a one inch carbide bit. And it's a high quality carbide bit. It's a, a Warmax 3.0. Uh, Famag, have you guys heard of that brand? Famag, Warmax is the line. They make a Boramax 1.0, 2.0, and a 3.0, and the 3.0 is their carbide version. Um, now I'm going to come back with the Boramax 2.0, which is a 1 and a 16th inch bit. Nobody makes a 1 and a 16th carbide, so this is the next best thing. Notice also that I've got this in a, uh, what's a good way to tilt that for you? Well, it's in a Morse taper adapter. Uh, instead of the, the uh, chuck, I have this in a Morse taper adapter, and now I can drill from, from the edge of the bit up until the ram. And that's four inches right there. Well, this base is only five inches, so I can easily drill from both sides. I don't need any kind of an extension or an adapter or anything like that. If that's not long enough, then I have another brand of bit that actually lets me go five inches. And that will easily, either one of these will probably easily do uh, a 10 inch mill. I don't need a big 10 inch extension to drill a, a base for a 10 inch mill. But, but Pat, you can only drill four inches and you're making a 10 inch mill. That's right. But remember, my base is not 10 inches because I have a head that's maybe two inches, three inches. So my base, this, these will easily drill. Uh, the base on a 10 inch mill. If you were going to drill, or if you're going to make like a 12, 14 inch mill, something like that, then you might need an adapter. But uh, I, I bought adapters. I just never, I have never used them. So I should bring them to the swap meet and, and sell them. <laughs> They're brand new. All right. This hole that I'm going to drill right now, to me, it's one of two critical holes because the grinding mechanism is going to mount in this hole. Manufacturer says a one and a sixteenth inch hole. I don't want anything bigger or else I have a sloppy fit. So this is my one and a sixteenth inch hole. Have you guys seen YouTubes or have you guys uh, seen people make mills where, where again, the, the wood is doing one of these things and their bit's doing one of these things? Do you think they're getting an accurate hole that way? Probably not. So I want you to look at my bit. I don't. I didn't bring a light. I want you to. If I use my phone light, will that wash it out? Because this is impressive. What I'm going to show you here. Oops, wrong button. I don't. I don't know if that's really showing it. What? And is that as far as you can zoom in? There you go. Watch my bit. I'm not even going to touch my bit. You tell me how much that bit wiggles. Ready? Here we go. Is my bit wiggling at all? Can you tell? I, I can guarantee it is not wiggling at all. What's that? Why? Because I used a one inch bit to remove the bulk, and now all this bit has to do is take it from one inch to one and a sixteenth. So there's no stress on the bit, there's no strain, there's no pressure, nothing like that. To go from one inch to one and a sixteenth, really all it's doing is taking a thirty second off of each side. So it's just skimming the walls. There's no pressure on it, no tension or anything. Now and now we're at the end of the one inch hole. The other thing I wanted to point out, did you guys notice how fast I was drilling? I'm not doing one of these things either. Let the wood, let the bit cut the wood. So another tip for you, after you drill this hole, turn the lathe off as you back the bit out. If this was still spinning and I backed this bit out, have you ever drilled a hole and you see a little curly cue coming off the bit? 
that means it's still cutting. That means the side of the, the, the uh, wing of the bit is scraping the sidewall of my hole. So now my one and a sixteenth inch hole that I want to be perfectly sized, it's not. It's a little bit bigger. So turn the lathe off as you, as you pull the bit out. Okay, now what we're going to do is, I don't know if the camera sh shows that very much, but we need to clean up the bottom surface. We need to detail this. Have you ever picked up a mill and it looks beautiful on the outside, nice and pretty, and then you turn it over and it's unfinished? I've seen mills like that before, and it's, they, don't, they don't sand it. It's still rough from being uh, drilled. It just looks terrible. Well, you wouldn't think to make a salad bowl and not finish the bottom. I don't know why they, they don't finish the bottom of the mills either. So there's a couple ways to, to clean up these holes. And one thing that I, uh, let's see where the, so what I started doing is I scraped my holes. Here, do, I, do you want me to do it this way? This is fine. Um, so I have two skews that I use, and I use them as negative rake, negative rake scrapers. Uh, I have what I call my right hand and my left hand, and the burr is on the top for this one, and it's on the top for this left-handed. So to clean up these holes, I'm just going to scrape them. Scraping end grain works really well. And I'll, even though this surface right here is, was cut cleaning from my gouge, I'll show you the uh, principle behind these. I'm going to cut about 9 o'clock. So this is... This has the burr on the top. I grind my skews straight across so it's nice and flat. So all I have to do is just move this back and forth. You can hear it right there. It's off a little bit. And that's the kind of stuff that I, that I get. So I'm not, it's not like I'm removing a whole bunch of wood or anything. Okay, now I'm going to clean up this hole here and then that hole there. I don't know if your view shows that. So an easy way to do that, if your lathe goes in reverse, is now I'm going I'm to spin the piece of wood in reverse and I'm going to scrape this opposite wall. That way, if I had it coming, if I had the wood spinning towards me, then I'd, then I'd have to lean over the lathe and do one of these. And I'm not going to tell you how long I did that before I figured out I can just stand upright and look at the, the opposite side. So again, the burr's on the top. I'm just going to take, I'll start on that inner hole. I don't know if you can see that now. And I'm just going to take little bites and work my way across. And then, then I can just go back and forth. And let's take a look at that. And you'd be surprised. I don't, I don't think your camera is going to see that. But that's a nice, clean surface right now. I've had some real bad tear out. And in a matter of 10, 15 seconds, it looks just like that. It just cleans it up so slick. So that's one of the steps that I've, I say that uh, I think I've improved upon from, uh, from the way I was taught. We used to do it a different way and it used to just take me so much longer. So let's let's clean up this big one and a five eighths. Again I'm going in reverse. I picked up the other skew now that's got the burr on top. And I'll just hit a little bit there. And I'll just work my way in. And then I can go back and forth. And let's see what that looks like. There you go. I don't know if your camera picks up on that, but there's no tear out on that either. Nice and perfect. And so that took a minute, two minutes, to clean up those two surfaces. And they're so clean that when I start sanding, and I'll start sanding right now, I start at 220 grit. And I'm not just saying that. This, that 220 is what I really start at. Oh, let's go the other way. And because they're cut so clean, it takes about that long, and then I'll do this surface right here, and that takes about that long. And serious, that's how much time it takes to sand these.
Of course, blow your dust out. And then I'll go 320. And so on, up to, I sand up to 1,000 grit. I would go 400, 600, 800, and 1,000. Those surfaces, if you could feel those right now, even at 400 grit, you'd be impressed. Um, I do not try and sand, let's see, where's your camera, there. Uh, I don't try and sand that surface right there. That, it's, it, I used to until I started using negative rake scrapers. I used to spend an insane amount of time trying to sand that. It's real difficult to get in there, first of all. Uh, and then I, I realized, you know what, the mechanism covers part of that surface anyway. And you're going to laugh, but the very first time the customer uses this, pepper dust will cover the rest of that surface. So they can't get their finger in there and touch that. So if it's scraped cleanly, you're good. You don't need to spend time trying to sand that surface. I sand this surface here because I sand this surface because that's, the, that's where I sign my name, and then this surface because they can see that as well. I'm going to put a little chamfer right there because we don't like sharp edges, right? Sharp corners. I'll, I'll hit that inner hole just a hair, just like that, and then I'll do this this surface, uh, about that much. Can you guys can you guys see that bevel? And that's why I do a bevel because a customer sees that also. I could just round this surface off, uh, round it over, um, but then there's nothing there to look at, right? So I like, uh, I like a bevel because the customer sees that. I don't know that they'll say, hey, I'm going to buy this pepper mill because he's got a bevel there, but uh, I like bevels. Uh, if there's any fuzzies on there, um, we'll hit those with sandpaper. Uh, you guys all know about folding your sandpaper in, in, about folding your sandpaper in thirds, right? Does everybody know about that? So if you take your sandpaper and then you just just curl it just a little. Let's see, where's my angle at? Uh, I, can't, I can't do that. There. And then you just curl it just a little bit. That stiffens it up. And now you, you're sanding just the bevel. And you're maintaining those two crisp edges on either side of that bevel. The reason I do the, the reason I sand this surface first and then this surface first before I do my bevel is because as you're sanding these two surfaces, if I had cut that bevel first, I, it would have got muddy. It would have got lost. I would have ended up sanding the, uh, the bevel without noticing. And you could apply sanding sealer if you wanted to uh, at this stage. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, I'm done with the base. Here we go. Uh, force of habit, I always mark my number one jaw just in case I forgot to sand or something like that. Now, most of this surface here is probably going to get turned away, um, but, uh, but at least it's been sanded. Okay, we're going to... Everybody with me? Any questions so far? Okay, so obviously that's where I cut them in part. Let's clean that up and make that look prettier. I'll go ahead and undercut this surface as well. I'll just use my little bowl gouge, quarter inch bowl gouge, just because it's it's cute and I just like using it. Looking a little bit low. And and a lot of this surface is probably going to get turned away as I uh, shape my profile, but that's okay. Okay, that's undercut, and that's flat also. That's what I like. Okay, now we're going to drill a hole. We'll drill that one and a sixteenth to uh, meet up with the other one. Uh, but just like before, we're going to use a one-inch carbide and remove the bulk. So I'm going to start the lathe again about 500 RPM. Uh, 
uh, stop short. Let's just make sure that's seated, and then we'll let the we'll go slow. Let the bit find its own center. All right, and I don't know if you can tell that that bit isn't wiggling either. Again, watch how fast I'm building. I'm not in a hurry. Let that bit do its job. And we just we just broke free. Alright, so that bit removed all the bulk and now we'll just uh, size it with our one and a sixteenth. And you'll get a better view of the uh, upload off so you can see it better. That helped or not. You can maybe see this better, how much it wiggles. Question. Because uh, that's a, that was that first bit was a one inch bit, uh, and I'm gonna and it doesn't matter if it enlarges the hole if you will because I'm gonna properly size it with this one with the one and a sixteenth. I actually like the C model because I don't have to turn the handle so many times to drill like I do on my lathe at home. And I can drill it. Well, I just broke free, but I could I could drill all the way up to here. I don't like extending my ram uh, real far, so if I had to drill deeper, I would I would shorten this up. And you can just push it, push the tailstock that way as you back the bit out, like that. If you need to shorten up that ram, okay. So now I am going to stop the bit, uh, stop the wood as I retract this one and a sixteenth. All right. So uh, I would I would scrape this surface if you need to uh, to clean it up to straighten it up. If there's any tear out, you can scrape that. Like uh, I don't do. I need to show you guys how I did that again, just with the skew back and forth. Um, something else that I do. You guys uh, you guys save your used sandpaper, don't you? you? You know you're supposed to use this once and throw it away, right? And how many how many people actually do that? Yeah, I don't do it either. So I save my used sandpaper, and I sand the inside of my hole. Um, I wa I don't get real crazy about it. I'm using 120 grit paper, and I just want to get rid of any fuzzies that there might be. And where the two holes came together, if there's a ridge right in the center, I just want to get rid of that. Um, I don't want to sand down here where the mechanism mounts, so I only want the sandpaper to go in just so far, and I've just got some reference marks on my stick to help me with that. But I just take my used 120, I try and keep the stick parallel with the, uh, with the lathe. You can usually feel if there's a ridge, and you can, you can hit that ridge. Otherwise, like I said, I'm just trying to get rid of any fuzzies that there might be. Um, the reason I do that is because it's about all I spend on it. Uh, the reason I, I sand the inside is a uh, couple of reasons. When the customer takes the top off to fill this up, I don't want them to see raw wood or rough wood or fuzzy wood. I want, I want them to see that I've taken the care to, to at least address that a little bit. Uh, the other reason is as smooth as you can make all these mating surfaces, then the smoother the top is going to turn as well. So I'll, I'll get rid of the fuzzies there. And if there's still tear out there, you know, that's okay. Don't get real crazy because you can really change the shape of that hole. I'm going to uh, just put a little bevel right there again, just like that. And then I would just hit that with the quick sandpaper. At home, the other thing I would do is I seal the inside of the pepper mill with um, amber shellac. So this is uh, two schools of thought on this. Some guys say don't do anything on the inside of the mill. Uh, leave it blank. Leave it plain wood. Well, the reason I use shellac is two reasons. One, it seals the wood. 
Not that it needs sealed, but it seals the wood. But the other reason, uh, and the reason I use amber shellac is because it's got a tint to it, uh, that again, when the customer takes the top off, they don't see bare wood. They see that I've taken care and that I've done something with that wood. It looks like it's finished. I don't want them to see unfinished wood. Uh, shellac, if you're not familiar with it, it's food safe. They coat pills with it, pills that we swallow. So it's food safe, it's odorless, has no odor at all. Uh, it dries quickly, it dries like in a matter of minutes. Um, and I use, uh, I, I was using the uh, I, blonde shellac, but then when it dries, it looks like you have bare wood, like looks just like this. So I started using amber uh, and you could use orange or garnet or something like that. Uh, just something that has a little bit of a tint to it that, uh, that colors the wood, if you will. Never use an oil-based product on the inside of a mill. So no Danish oil, no Watco, no, no mineral oil, no, no walnut oil, no oil of any kind, period. No lacquer, nothing like that because they have a smell. And trust me when I say that smell will never go away. It will never go away. Shellac is odorless. Um, somebody asked, well, can I use wax? Um, I don't know how you're going to buff the wax out once you get it inside, so I, wouldn't, I would not use wax. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter if you use uh, wax, um, de-waxed or wax shellac. It doesn't matter because we don't have a finish that we're putting over the top of this. So I just buy the little can of, uh, of uh, Zinser Bullseye. Uh, shellac, amber shellac. I looked upstairs and they sell it, but they have the bigger can. So go to you know the big box store and buy a little can, and it'll last you forever. Uh, we're done with the bottom. How am I doing on time, by the way? Eight o'clock. So I have forty-five minutes. Eight oh five. So I have forty minutes. Okay. I I have a little uh, acid brush. And I just dip it in the shellac, and then I can, I can actually, on a 10-inch mill with an 8-inch body, I can get in there uh, 4 inches uh, f from each side. <laughs> I do like my tenons that run straight. Uh, one other thing I'm just going to say, this has nothing to do with uh, making pepper mills, but you guys notice when I turn the lathe on and off, I'm not using the on and off switch. I'm using the, the speed control. Get in the habit of doing that. First of all, it, it saves you from wearing out your on off switch, but also you'll never be surprised by uh, if I was to just turn this on and off, you know, geez, I just got done running something at 2,000 RPM and now I'm putting a big, uh, big wet unbalanced blank on it and did that happen to you no oh yes I've, I've done it both ways um, I've put shellac on with it with the uh, the piece still mounted and I'll just manually do it that way but anymore I do it uh, off the lathe uh, and then if I dribble uh, it doesn't get all over my lathe or inside my chuck or anything like that Thanks for the question. Oh, so the question was, do I apply the shellac on or off the lathe with the piece on the lathe or not? And I usually do it off the lathe. I take it downstairs where I do all my finishing and I, and I do the shellac that way. Was there another question? Nope. You guys are you're too quiet tonight. Okay, we are going to, we're going to make a spigot. So this is my, this is my head or my top. And I need to make a spigot that fits into this one in a sixteenth inch hole that I just cut. And I bet you just that little bit of sanding that I did, I enlarged that hole by a thirty second. Just that little bit of sanding. So I'm going to set my calipers for just a little bit larger and I'm going to create a, a spigot on here. I'm going to use my beading and parting tool again. I don't know if the angle shows up. 3 8 beating and parting. And when you use parting tools, it's, it's, you don't just shove it straight in. It's an arcing cut. So you start up and you arc towards center. But I'm not going to try and make it all in one, in one width. I'll uh, take a couple of passes. I 
I only make my uh, spigots. Uh, before I get, before I go there, I've been calling. I called this a spigot, but yet I've been calling these tenons. So this is a tenon. That's a tenon. That's a tenon. In fact, let's put a tenon right here too. So what's the difference between a spigot and a tenon? Anybody know? Is there a difference? Anybody know? I think the terms are used interchangeably, but I googled it and I said, what's the difference between a tenon and a spigot? And Google says that a spigot is straight and a tenon is dovetailed. And I like that analogy. In, uh, in my uh, book over there, Chris West uses the same reference. Uh, I like that analogy because now when I, when I start talking spigot, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. If I was to refer to this as a tenon, you'd say, wait a minute, you have one, two, three, four, now you have, which tenon are you talking about, right? So now if I call that a spigot, I think you guys uh, will know more what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to size that. Oh, uh, one other thing about my spigot. They don't have to be, you know, two inches long or even an inch long. I make mine three-eighths of an inch long uh, because that's as wide as my parting tool. So I don't have to measure. I just, I just make it three-eighths of an inch, inch long. And that's why I only need to allow a half an inch extra length on my wood. A sixteenth inch parting cut, three-eighths of a spigot, and, uh, and there's my eight inch mill out of an eight and a half inch blank. Now I'm, Rick Gore is not here tonight but he doesn't like doing this. He doesn't like sizing uh, tenons under power. Spigot, thank you. He doesn't like sizing spigots under power. Thank you. Now, everybody says that you have to have a tight fit right here, that this spigot has to fit tight into the base so that you can jam them together to turn the outside profile. So I set my calipers for just a little bit larger uh, than the, uh, I set my calipers for a little bit larger than the hole, so my spigot was supposed to be a tight fit, but it's not. Okay, so you know how to fix that, right? No, you take off more wood, and that'll make it tighter. <laughs> Isn't that how you do that? It Maybe that's why it never works that way for me. I'm not going for a tight fit. I'm going for my final fit right now. My final fit is a loose fit. I want a little bit of, I don't know if that shows up in the camera, but I want a little bit of play just like that. A um, lot of guys that make that tight fit, when, you get, when they get all done shaping it, then they say, well, just sand that a little bit more. Just sand this a little bit more. Put some wax on it. Just work it in. It'll loosen up. I don't have to do any of that stuff because I have my final fit right now. And have you ever used a pepper mill that squeaks when you turn the top? And why does the top squeak? Because it's too tight. Mine will never squeak because I have a little bit of play right there never squeaks. So there's, a, there's another tip for you. I'll show you how I jam chuck it in just a sec. I want this surface to be undercut just a little bit. Um, I forgot to say, so I, I was making a joke there when I said you if you take off more wood it makes it tight. Um, did you notice, so I, I, I used my beating and parting tool to just get it down to rough size and then when I'm when I'm doing my final fit I switch to my skew because the point of the skew gets into that corner a lot easier. If I was to continue using this I'd, I'd be fighting against that shoulder a lot and I wouldn't get a, a perfectly straight um, perfectly straight spigot. And, and when I use the uh, skew uh, it's not a peeling cut. It, it, it's a full-on scrape. It's coming in straight on, 90 degrees, it's, and it's doing a scrape, and it leaves a beautiful surface. Okay, let's, we'll clean up this surface. 
and you can use a, again your favorite tool I'll just switch to a, a spindle gouge Undercut and straight. Yes. Uh, what do I have on my tool handle? Uh, this is the uh, 3M um, craft supply sells it. It's the 3M uh, stretch wrap. It's like an ace bandage that sticks to itself. So I've got it on all my tools. Um, they make different colors. I don't have the grip that I used to, and and this stretch wrap just really makes all the difference in the world. And you can tell it gets kind of grody, but it still works just great. Um, Craft Supply used to sell it with about six different colors. Now they're down to like blue, orange, and red are the only colors. But every, every tool that I've got, I've got, I've got the uh, stretch wrap on. I think it's called, what? it's called what now? Vet wrap. Vet wrap. Yeah. I, I think Craft Supply calls it a cohesive utility yeah. wrap or something like that. Cheaper as vet wrap. As vet wrap. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all my handles. Whether it's a, a well, now this one doesn't have it because it's got the rubber grip, but usually every every tool I've got, um, and this stuff gets on there. I mean, it it. If I tried to peel this off now to rewrap it, forget it. Just wrap over the top of it. Okay. The next thing to do, and I hope I brought one. Uh, so this surface was under. I undercut it. Uh, if if it uh, wasn't clean, I could still use a skew to clean that up. The next thing to do is is to mount this guy. And this, they call this the uh, turn plate or the drive plate. And a lot of people will just mount this on the end of the spigot. They'll just center it. Uh, and then they just drill holes and screw it in place. Well, you can imagine it won't take much. Have you ever tried drilling in a screw and it just shifts something off just a hair? That's what's going to happen. People that do this, I automatically dislike their YouTube video. Because um, that's not good. I don't do it that way. I don't automatically discount their YouTube video. I just say they, they should watch my video and learn how to do it. <laughs> and then they say, please don't comment on my YouTubes anymore. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do, I like, I like perfect holes, right? The key to pepper mills is alignment. The key to alignment is accuracy, accurate holes. So if I was to just stick that drive plate on the end there uh, and screw it in place, it's not going to be as accurate as doing it this way. So the drive plate that I'm using, the deluxe mechanism, this drive plate is just a little bit larger than 7 eighths of an inch diameter. If you use the artisan mechanism, their drive plate is 3 quarters of an inch. So be sure and just you know, check the uh, directions that come with your kit. So this is a little bit larger than 7 eighths of an inch. I have a 7 eighths of an inch bit in here, and I'm just going to drill a little hole, a uh, shallow hole, just to recess that plate. It's not going to fit. I'll have to enlarge it, uh, but that's easy to do. So again, I go slow, let this register. If this wiggles a little bit, it's OK, because I, I need to make it, make it fit that anyway. And it really only needs to go, you know, 3.30 seconds or something. This is only about an eighth of an inch thick, so I usually go 3.30 seconds. And then the heads of the screws are just a little bit recessed. OK, so while I'm all set up and in a drilling mood, let's drill a hole through the head for our drive shaft, or for our rod, drive rod. So again, I'm not going to try and drill all the way through. I'm only going to go in part, uh, go part way, like halfway. Oh, thank you. Good question. What size drill bit? The shaft that comes with the kits. Uh, that's a, actually a great question. Uh, the shaft is is a quarter of an inch in size. Some directions will tell you drill a quarter of an inch hole. 
So think about that. I got a quarter of an inch hole, and now I'm trying to shove a quarter inch shaft through this through that hole. How well do you think that's going to work? Not, not well. So this is uh, a quarter inch is the same thing as 1664 ths and I know this for a fact because I've been helping my granddaughter with her fractions in fourth grade. So a quarter of an inch is 1664 ths This is 1764 ths uh, if you and you can buy these bits for about five bucks. If you don't have a 1764, the next step up is 1864, which is the same thing as 930 seconds. So you could use 1764 or 930 seconds. I would not go any larger than that uh, because then it just gets to be too sloppy of a fit. I use a 1764 because I figure if the if the bit's going to wiggle, it'll wiggle to a 930 seconds, and then I'm still good. That's just my logic. Um, brings up another point. If you ever drill any of these holes, any of these holes that I drilled, if you ever drill them too big, how do you fix that? You don't? Just drill a, just make a plug to fit. Just make a plug that fits whatever size hole you have, glue it in, and then redrill the hole. And I've done that for every hole that, that is here. I've, I've uh, made a mistake, used the wrong, you know, get sidetracked and I used the wrong bit or whatever. Of course, I haven't done that for years, but, but that's how you fix a hole that's too big. Nice and easy. If it wiggles a little bit, well, I don't like that, but you're able to see how accurate all my holes are. Uh, just use, uh, uh, techniques that I do. Okay, I will stop it while I pull this out because that's 1764. Um, all right, now at this stage I could start sanding, and and just like before, I'd start here at 220. I do 220, 320. I would not touch the spigot until I get to 400 grit. If you use 220 and 320 on this spigot. Uh, that is aggress the sandpaper is aggressive enough that uh, it'll change the shape of it. 220 and 320 will change the shape of this spigot, but I, it just takes a little bit like that. And again, I would go up to a thousand grit and uh, and call that good. I almost forgot to do something. We have to size our drive plate to make that fit. You were just going to sit back there and see if I caught that, weren't you? They're like, I bet he forgets to do that. All right, so to size that, we're going to use our, our friend the skew again. And we're just, this has the burr on top. And I'm going to use the point, which is called the toe, just like your foot, toe and heel. So the toe is the part that sticks out farther. I'm going to use the toe, and I'm going to use this edge of the bevel, because that's a sharp edge, isn't it, from being ground? So I'm just going to scrape this hole to fit my drive plate. I'm, I'm trying to cut about 9 o'clock. And, and I'm going to keep the uh, skew level with the ways. You can hear it's not quite running true, right? And take it easy here on this. This is the, I don't know if you remember earlier when I was talking about drilling the hole in the bottom where the mechanism mounts, I said that's an accurate hole uh, to me, and I, a critical hole, and I want that to be perfectly sized. Well, this is part of the mechanism as well, so I want this to be perfectly sized. Normally, I have my tool rest out there, so I don't have to keep moving it to check my fit. And it usually takes me about half a dozen tries to do this because I'm taking off dust and I, I want a perfect fit. And even in the demo, and I have to uh, take my time. And I want that to just drop in the bottom. I don't want to have to push it down to the bottom. I want it to just drop down. And you, you can see, I don't well, maybe you can't. Anyway, that's 
dust. That's basically just dust that I'm taking off. Okay, we're getting there. I told you it takes me about six tries. Dust off in between so that doesn't uh, mess you up. That's a little bit tight. Oops. One more cut, right? One more cut. Oops. So if I were to, to make this too big, this would be a sloppy fit. And this is what affects your alignment for the head to fit down on the base. If this is sloppy, that can cause your head to, to bind. It can knock your uh, head out of alignment with the base, so your gap between top and bottom is uneven. So when I, when I said earlier, at the beginning of the demo, I said that use a dry piece of wood, um, and I said there are a couple other things that can cause the, the uh, head to bind. The spigot not being round and accurate, and this drive plate, that hole through the center, if those are not accurate, that throws your top off. And there we go, just drops down into the bottom. So now, when my, sh my, when my uh, shaft comes up through the center, my shaft is perfectly centered in my hole, my drive plate is perfectly centered in my spigot, my spigot is running perfectly through, I'm, I'm setting myself up for success that my top and bottom are going to fit together the way they should. All right. So now we need to reverse this and drill a hole from the top. And this is why I bought these jaws, these shark jaws. Because of their extra length, now when I mount this in the lathe, can you do the overhead shot? So now, oh well. Well, now when I mount this in the lathe, there's, there's plenty of room that it, it's not going to touch my spigot. I just got done sanding that baby to 1,000 grit, right? So if you have the standard jaws, the standard length jaws, the spigot is going to bottom out in the jaws. So these, again, because I've got big diameter and because of the depth, they, they're not going to touch my spigot. If you have the uh, standard two and a half or two inch jaws that come with the, the VM100, if you open those up all the way, they'll fit a, a 10 in this size. If you've got the VM120, the bigger chuck that has the standard jaws, those will fit. And the spigot will go in between the middle of these jaws. Uh, so just check your jaw combination. If, if, you, if all you've got is just those standard jaws, what you can do then is you can make, make something like this, just a disc that clamps in, the, uh, clamps in your jaws and then clamp down on top of your spigot that way. I actually prefer a, like a split ring design, if you will. And it'll clamp around that spigot. And you can size this whatever size you need to to fit your jaws. And you can hold that. And that'll run perfectly true. And now you can finish drilling your hole uh, in the head that way. I've seen some guys on YouTube that they get a dislike also if they grab the spigot to finish drilling a hole in the head. Again, we just got done sanding that to 1,000 grit. And now you're going to grab that in some little pin jaws. What do you think that's going to do to the spigot? I don't, not good things. It's gonna it's gonna deform it. It's gonna crush it. It's gonna put jaw marks in it. And to me, that's just that doesn't say quality. So those are. I told you I'm pretty passionate about pepper mills. So these are all things that uh, that I I try and avoid, and I try and make the you know a, a nice quality mill. Uh, before I drill that, I'm going to do one thing. The design that I'm making tonight calls for an, a, uh, a dished out top. So I'm going to do that. I'll do that real quick before I drill my hole. Oh, not running through anyway. So uh, this is all part of my design. So by, by dishing this out, I'm in effect, I'm reducing the height of my mill, aren't I? I've taken that into account with, this, with my other holes that I drilled and with the size of the blank that I've got and things like that. 
So that's why having a design full scale, I think, is just so important. Okay, so that's dished out just a little bit. Okay, we're gonna, and it's cut cleanly also. Uh, another quick tip before you take it off of here, go ahead and sand that. It's a lot easier to sand it right now uh, instead of waiting until later. Okay, let this get started. Say so you can usually hear when the uh, when you when it breaks free because the air sounds different. But I don't know if you heard that with my compressor kicked on. But I should be. Yeah. All right. So that's it. That's the top. We're done with the top. We finally finished step two. Step two takes forever. Oh, I'm doing good then. That's why I make an easy shape. I can make it in five. Thanks. Thanks, though. All right. Step three. We need to uh, shape the outside profile. The uh, directions that come with your kit will tell you to uh, make a jam chuck. Something like this. Where's my camera? Something they'll say, make a jam chuck that fits into that that one and a sixteenth inch hole. Um, and you can do it that way. Uh, but I make enough mills that I would be forever futzing around with uh, jam chucks trying to get them to fit the hole. Because, you know, what if this is just a little bit different size from one to the next? So some, some other jaws that I bought to help me with mills is these long nose jaws. And I just have tape on them to uh, pad them a little bit. But now it doesn't matter what size that hole is. Whether it's a 16th inch larger or 30 seconds smaller, it doesn't matter. Uh, now I can just grip into that big 1 and 5 8 inch hole and it works just fine. All right, but before I do that, I need to fit these together, right? How am I going to jam chuck those together? I am going to take a, uh, a tip from box makers. Box makers will take a, uh, a tissue or a sheet of toilet paper and they'll jam fit the lid onto the box so they can finish the box top. So I'm going to take a blue shop towel and I'm going to jam fit my lid onto my top onto the base. I just push it in part way until it makes a detent. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that uh, kind of detent there? And then I'm going to cut, uh, come about a quarter of an inch outside that and cut it out. Uh, and you can use a regular paper towel. Some paper towels have a lot of quilting. Uh, so that means that they have uneven density, uneven thickness. But give it a try. Uh, these blue shop towels are pretty consistent thickness, uh, and they work well. You can buy a roll of, shop of these blue shop towels at auto stores. Costco sells a big 12-pack of them. Um, something that I ran into a couple months ago by accident is a gun cleaning patch. If you have a round, one and three-quarter inch gun cleaning patch, or just cut one that size, works perfect because it's nice and consistent thickness. It's 100% cotton. It's strong. You can, I can reuse them four and five times, whereas a lot of times this is a, a once and done. But the idea, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make, if you will, a bottle cap. And I want this to cover the spigot, come down the sides of the spigot, and stop. I don't want it to flow out onto this, onto this mating surface, because then that will keep these two from joining together. And it doesn't take much uh, to, to throw the alignment off. 
So I just want this to come down the sides of the spigot, and I know the camera is not going to be able to, to see that. Well, where am I at? I don't know. Yeah, you're not going to be able to see that. Yeah, take my word for it. And then I'm just going to push them together. And and there's my and there's my jam fit. So what you can do is you can do two of them. Make a little tighter one. But I tell you as many times as I've done this <laughs> No, uh, that that would swell the fibers and everything. But uh, I've got this surface sanded to a thousand grit and stuff, and I don't want to have to resand it. I do save these. Actually, maybe it'd be better to do that. I save these uh, if they're in pretty good shape, and uh, after you've used them once or twice, they'll they kind of flatten out, if you will. They get a little bit thinner. So that's usually when I'll. If I need a tighter fit, that's when I jam. Uh, that's when I use two of these together. That felt kind of loose, but okay. Let's see how we do this time. If not, I need to borrow some water. No, I'm just kidding. There we go. Okay. So now, let's put our uh, revolving center. 10 minutes. OK. Thank you. So I'm going to put a cone center on my revolving center. The cone centers that come with your lathe are usually metal. Metal will leave a black ring around this hole. I didn't like that because then I had to sand it or whatever. So then I made made one of these out of wood. I thought wood will be better. Well, that worked great until I got some slippage. And what do you think happens when you have wood against wood spinning at 1500 RPM slipping? Makes a bound ring, bound mark. Yeah. So I uh, I got some of this high density plastic, and even though it's black plastic, it leaves no mark at all, and it works great. And on the metal ones, I tried putting tape on them and all that kind of stuff. So, sorry, I just got to say, look at how true my tenons are. I am, I am perfect, aren't I, tonight? I'm five for five. I'm going to round this, uh, just, just hit this real quick again. And I'm going to make a couple of layout lines. So the shape that I'm going to make tonight, I've, I've made it a bunch of times. And I know that the wide point of my base is right there. The narrow point of my top is right there. And I'm going to size these. And I'll show you. OK, that goes to about 2 or 5 eighths. And I'm going to use a. This time I'm going to use a diamond parting tool to just size this. And the reason I'm using a diamond parting tool is because it's, it's wider and it allows me to use my calipers in one shot. When you use calipers of any kind, whether it's the wishbone kind or what, always come in from the back. Don't ever come in from the top. The tendency is uh, you would shove them down and distort that reading. My design, and I'm right there already, my design calls for the same diameter top as the white part on my base. Your design might be something different, which is fine. Sometimes people make the top diameter smaller than the, uh, smaller than the, the base. Whoop. I was going to say, even though it's a jam fit, you can't get too aggressive. But you're going to see me get pretty aggressive because I only have 10 minutes left. All right. Now, one of the other tools that I bought to help me make pepper mills, I could use my, spin, my uh, spindle roughing gouge, my big one, but I bought a smaller one that I like. This is a three-quarter inch 
Uh, I got it from D-Way, and uh, it just helps me with uh, long flowing curves. And I'm just going to take this down. And this is why I'm making a real simple shape, because I'm running out of time. And I just work the whole blank. I don't uh, concentrate on one particular spot. Uh, working the whole blank just helps me see the overall profile better. So this design that I'm making, I know Don's heard of this guy. There's a guy named Vic Firth, F-I-R-T-H. Have you guys ever, anybody else heard of him? Have you? So Vic, uh, and you probably know more about, you guys know more about Vic than I do. Vic was a, he's not a drummer, he was a... Timpanist of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I knew he was with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. A timpanist with the, did I say that right? Timpanist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He played the high-end drums, right? Something like that. He had his own company, and they made uh, drumsticks. They made wooden drumsticks. And I, I don't, I know no, nothing about drumsticks, but from what I read, they're they're pretty good. They're, they're uh, nice drumsticks. A lot of famous uh, drummers, including Don, has a set, and uh, many sets. Well, after a while, they, the Vic Firth Company started to make pepper mills. And uh, the shape that, that I'm making here is a shape that they made, that Vic made. And uh, Vic is no longer with us, but he, uh, before he passed, I think, uh, I think it was before he passed, he sold the company to Fletcher's Mill. So if you go to Fletcher'sMill.com, they still make this same shape. I like making this shape in a demo because you saw how fast I can do it. And there we go. Now, uh, one other thing I do, again, negative rake scrapers, is I use a negative rake scraper just to uh, smooth out any bumps. The DVD that I've got over there by Ted Sokolowski, Ted uses a negative rake scraper, negative rake scrapers, and he refers to them as finesse scrapers, which which is a good, accurate uh, description because all I'm doing is I'm just trying to finesse the curves, get rid of any any bumps, any high spots. Using a negative rake scraper uh, has, uh, again, it's cut down my production time. You don't have to sand as much because you're starting off with a smooth surface. You don't have any ridges to get rid of. It's a nice light touch. Uh, I do with the negative rake scraper. The, the downside of scrapers is that you're cutting with the burr. And, you know, burrs don't last very long, like maybe 30 seconds. Uh, but it seems like I get, I get longer life, if you will, uh, as, as opposed to, if I run it slower, as opposed to full speed. So that will smooth that out feels nice and smooth. If, if it's a rough surface, it will sand quickly because it's all side grain. And it'll, it'll just sand up and nothing flat. This particular shape, because there's really, I mean, it's just one big curve, this is the only shape I make that I uh, power sand at home. I'll take a, a, or a, a two inch disc and I can power sand this and be done with it in you know five, 10 minutes. Every other mill that I make, I hand sand. And a couple of quick tips, so we're done with step two, uh, step three. Shape the outside profile. Uh, almost. Forgot, I do one more thing. How much time do I have? Got it. Got it. Okay, I do, I do a couple other detail, quick details. I always put a, uh, you guys know I like my chamfers, right? I always put a chamfer on the bottom edge. It's a design point that uh, 
just gives a little bit of lift to the mill. It doesn't just come down on the table and plop. And then I uh, have a little jig I made up. And then I do another V cut right here. Again, just a design point. This is about the only time you see me using a skew how you're supposed to use it. So I am I am not a skew master. Oops. Come on, get in there. Okay, and then right where this joint is, I'm gonna do a V cut right there also, which kind of helps hide the joint. Oops. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Like that. Okay, now one advantage, let's see if this one will, will make a liar out of me. One advantage of the way that I jam chuck them together is I can release my, my tailstock pressure. I can pull this away and I can clean up that V cut if I didn't get all the way in the bottom or I need to sand it or something like that and it's still running true. But I did a good job cutting that. Okay, so now step four real quick, sand and I'll be done. So a couple of quick tips on sanding, 500 RPM. I'm gonna reverse the lathe so the dust goes your way, not mine. When you sand, uh, try and avoid, if you use the paper sandpaper, the edge of your sandpaper will usually leave a line in your spindle. Have you ever noticed that before? Leaves a little line. So if you use cloth back paper uh, and hold it at an angle, it doesn't leave, I'm going too fast. Uh, cloth back paper doesn't leave a line even if I, even if I was to go like this. I usually hold it at an angle because it goes up and down the curves easier. Uh, but again, even if I held it like that, the edge of the paper doesn't leave a, doesn't leave a line. So cloth back paper, and you can buy, uh, I just looked upstairs, they sell one of those little sample kits for the pen turners. It's like five or six rolls of different grits for like $15. Otherwise, you can, you can buy cloth back paper and just uh, cut it yourself. So that's cloth back. The other thing I really like are these sanding sponges. Uh, Festool makes them, uh, uh, Unita, another company. The thing about these though, you gotta be serious about sanding because you buy these rolls, they come in a box about this big, it's like 75 yards and it's $75. And they make about eight or nine different grits and I bought them all. But what's nice about them is they come in a, in a square and I cut them into strips. And uh, the, they work well and the foam kind of protects your hands if there's any kind of heat buildup. Of course, if you're getting heat buildup, it might be because your sandpaper is dull, you're going too fast, pressing too hard, or something like that. But uh, if you have an opportunity to try the sanding sponges, uh, they're worth it as well. And I would sand that up to 1,000 grit. This question? Oh, 50 cents a sheet? Yeah. Oh, cool. Good to know. Yeah, then you can just try try the different uh, grits that way. Cut them into strips. Uh, so in, uh, in an hour and a half, uh, those are the steps that I take to make the perfect pepper mill. Finish. My finish is usually a couple of coats of Danish oil followed by a couple of coats of uh, gloss polyurethane just to get, the, to get a sheen. Any other questions? Don. Do you use, uh, when you're drilling the holes, the mechanism, do you use drill I, I, do, I drill them by hand. Um, and again, because I do so many of them, I, I made up a disc that fits in here with the two holes. And I just drop the disc down, and I can just drill perfectly sized holes. And I don't have to worry about trying to, trying to size the mechanism and stuff like that. For this, for the drive plate, you can just drill those by hand. But uh, yeah, for these, I pre-drill and I use a really small bit. I don't remember what size it is. Um, but but yeah, I dropped. I I don't think I brought it, but 
just if, if you make more than one or two, um, I, I made up a disc that fits down in there and uh, has the two holes perfectly spaced and boom, boom, and away I go. Um, there was one other thing I was going to say about that, and I don't forget. I don't, or I forget what it was, but yeah, thanks. Final finish, spray? No, wipe on. Wipe it on, uh, let it sit for a minute, wipe it all off. Wipe off as much as you can. Uh, and what you're doing is you're wiping it off the surface, and it's, but it's in the pores, um, but uh, it takes, takes a few coats to build it up on the surface to get a nice sheen. Um, yeah, but all, all of my mills there, uh, wipe on. Danish oil with, followed by a couple of coats of, and you, you don't have to use a wipe on poly, you can just use Danish oil because it has poly in it anyway. Um, but it might take five or six coats. You could put sanding sealer on here and that would cut down the amount of coats you'd have to use, but uh, I usually forget and I'm, so I just, I just go right for the Danish oil and I make my own Danish oil and yeah. So what else was I was gonna say? I don't remember. So, all right. Well, thanks. Did I run out of time? <laughs> Good. So I, I will take this home, uh, and I'll sand it up the rest of the way, um, and then I'll apply finish and all that stuff. So just like what I was saying. But uh, yeah, there's my demo, demo meal. Thanks. Thank you. One thing I didn't mention is Rockers is having a VIP event on August 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, anybody in the wood turning group is invited. There's a free gift to the first 100 people in the door at 6 p.m. Um, they have all kinds of great deals, drawings, prizes, things like that. So if you guys want to come, it's October 18th at 6 p.m. I'm sorry, August. I'm ahead of myself. It's August 18th.